Luke, yeah. you work for the UNCCD, which looks at fighting desertification all around the globe. In April, your organization had a substantial look at where countries are at with their fight against desertification. You had a look at action program alignment, role of CSOs in the process, knowledge sharing systems, national monitoring system, standardizing reporting, and a whole lot more, I believe. Then there was also a scientific conference which looked at a, the economic aspects and sustainable land management in dry lands. Uh, with the benefit of hindsight now, a couple of weeks later, what do you think is the most important outcome of these conferences? The conference was uh, just the first shot of a total evaluation of the economics of land degradation and SLM, uh, sustainable land management. There are many outcomes. Let me just highlight the three of them. Uh, first is that uh, focusing on preventing desertification, land degradation, and mitigation, mitigating the effect of drought is far better than rehabilitating uh, degraded land. So it means prevention is far uh, less costly than uh, restoring, restoring degraded land. Second is in monetary terms, um, the cost of land degradation is in the range of 490 billion US dollar per year regarding on-site cost to people. And this is about 5% uh, of the agricultural GDP globally. But in some countries, it is even far more uh, high because in Burkina Faso, for instance, land degradation is costing the nation of Burkina Faso up to 9% of the agricultural GDP of Burkina Faso. And even in Guatemala, it is up to 24% of the agricultural GDP of Guatemala. That's how uh, important uh, land degradation uh, could be. And the third point I would like to mention is also the fact that there's not enough information uh, or accuracy in the information available to draw firm conclusions. And this is, to some extent, uh, contributing to policy in action. So those are the three points I would like to make. Uh, though there are many other conclusions one could draw from the findings of the conference. You already spoke about successful sustainable land management. And uh, what's the most important lesson learned there? Maybe, maybe you also have an example for a successful intervention in the field. There are many. I have seen many success stories. Let me be more specific about a case in Guatemala. Could you imagine that in Guatemala, a, a, a cement corporation being, uh, being now uh, one of the investors in land re rehabilitation? This is quite surprising, but the point is that uh, taking advantage of initial uh, governmental subsidies, they started, you know, restoring uh, to afforestation some of the degraded land uh, in the areas where they have their uh, cement uh, plants. What happens is that the subsidy has been phased out and they, they continue because producing uh, through cogeneration energy, they found that this is quite comparable to importing energy from the U.S. So today they continue uh, afforestation. And this is part of, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, three to five percent of their energy needs, and this is part of their business process. So across the globe, there are so many good practices, success stories, and conducive policies which we really need to bring to the fore. Thank you very much for that colorful example. UNCCD and your organization in particular is operating on, a, on the policy level, obviously. Um, if you could just put this into a perspective now, what, what do you think, we're, what has to be done on that, in that policy environment to enable sustainable land and soil management practices? What has been hampering the impact of the Convention at country level is basically the fact that affected developing countries, though they, most of them, they have actually designed and approved their national action plan, they have failed to a large extent to mainstream this in their national platform for poverty alleviation, food security, and uh, sustainable development, including sustainable growth. 
And the lack of mainstreaming is actually the major cause of lack of investment in addressing land degradation. So to address this issue, we need to bring to the fore the cost of inaction versus the benefit of action. So the cost of land degradation to, com to be compared to the benefits of sustainable land management. When you consider that, for instance, in, uh, in Niger, overgrazing is costing in the range of 1100 US dollar per hectare to the, to the nation. Now, how do you avoid over overgrazing as one of the major causes of uh, the situation in Niger? The, what the investment needed, if it, it is done through, let's say, governmental managed projects, it is within the range of 200 US dollars per hectare, which is one fifth of the cost of inaction. Now, when you do it through uh, community uh, approaches involving communities, this cost may just be, you know, in the range of 50 to 60 US dollars. So bringing those information to ministers of finance and also uh, with the understanding that addressing land degradation is about, you know, improving the yield of the, of the land sustainably, sometimes doubling or tripling sustainably the output of the land. It is about taking population out of poverty and ensuring their food security and building their resilience. Those are the type of information we need to equip government with. I wanted to ask you a little bit about the policies being papers. Um, you work in a UN organization, there's a lot of expertise, it's, it's very knowledge information driven, and you, you go in there with a, and you try to convince your, your stakeholders with a lot of knowledge and information. But we also know that behind any uh, proper policy, you will need money behind this, you will need political will behind it, and you need to acknowledge that, that there is a political economy that works in the field. Are there any particular selling points that you use to promote your issues there beyond just information? I think that being a more effective knowledge broker is certainly the point uh, on which we, we need to, you know, make much more breakthrough. Because what is needed for policymakers uh, to, you know, assess existing policy is precisely the knowledge they need regarding their current uh, policy environment and, and existing practices. So as the UN institution, our responsibility is much more on the normative side of existing practices and information regarding what is available as uh, uh, good practices to which could be uh, used as reference to assess and amend uh, existing context and our, our, one of uh, our other responsibility is, of course, uh, assisting government in monitoring uh, what is being done. Since you spoke about land here as a very important factor, obviously, I wanted to ask you about the scientific advice. How do you, how do you organize scientific advice, um, especially with regards to the what I heard about that there's. Uh, people thinking about independent panel on land to be, to be established and that there's a bit of a different opinion. I think that globally, one of the things we have, uh, the, we have researched about the most is agriculture. So there's a wealth of, uh, of knowledge about how we should manage land and soil, of course, with implication on water resources. But those knowledge, unfortunately, are just, you know, trapped into silos uh, here and there in the world. So my plea is that we need to have an authoritative mechanism, platform, name it the way you prefer, but an authoritative way to bring to the fore the, the knowledge we, we, we have to care for our, our soil. In the UNCD, one of our motto has been, and one of our motto has been enhancing soil anywhere, enhances life everywhere. And this needs to be translated. Yes, there are solutions. One could be using the IPBS 
And I look forward to seeing how IPBS will consider this. And probably another way is to really consider a, a fully fledged mechanism or platform to attend to land and soil uh, uh, science and knowledge. The UNCCD uh, next conference of the parties, which will take place in Winduk, Namibia, from the 16th to the 27th of September, will consider four options, the four options which have been assessed by uh, an ad hoc working group established by the, the previous uh, session of the COP. And I look forward to seeing uh, the wisdom of the COP op operating on that. One more question to you with regards to us being here with the Global Donor Platform for Rural Development, bringing together the, the strategy question and also what you just said in terms of setting up a, a possible mechanism for land. How can donors be supportive of, of that? Donors can be supportive at three levels. And let me start with the local level, which I believe is the most important one. At the local level, we will need to empower local communities so much so that they will establish a holistic management of their natural resources. We must be aware that you know farmers are the largest biodiversity managers of our planet. They are also smart investors. They do not need government partners. They need to put in place mechanisms to bring the investment and assistance and support at the local level to, to drive a sound and smart management of natural resources and land will benefit from that. The second level, of course, is national policies do not need to also agree with government on how existing policies could be improved uh, and amended and how to establish smart subsidies and how to phase out inappropriate subsidies as well. And and the third level is the global level. And the global level, we must also agree that land degradation is being driven by, you know, uh, poorly designed policies and misplaced investment or the lack of investment. Donors globally need also to come together and decide on how this could be amended and how this could be improved. So. You, now, in, in, to be more specific, in the UNCD, there have been a number of initiatives uh, which uh, could uh, be used as a kind of learning ground or, or an example to, to, to be emulated by some other donors. The government of Korea uh, launched the Chongwon Initiative, which was precisely meant to support and enhance the implementation of the 10-year strategy in, in some specific aspects, being supporting the alignment of the national action plan and supporting the, the, the mainstreaming of those national action plans, but also supporting the knowledge sharing. And we can also mention the initiative supported by the government of Germany with a number of other partners, including the European Commission, uh, regarding the total value of the economics of land degradation. Those elements will have not only global impact, but will be translated at national level. If we run many national case studies of the economics of land degradation, we are likely to equip those governments with elements, information to mainstream the issues of land, land degradation and sustainable land management in their national budget programming and investment. Thank you very much, Luke. Thank you very much, Pascal.